So I start already. Yep. Okay. So hello everyone. Good evening. Welcome to this workshop, Basics of Deep Learning, presented by me, Zhen Yang, a year six student in Dunman. Before we start, let's look at the layout of this workshop. First, we will have some introduction about what deep learning is and uh, some other not so important stuff. After that, I will introduce to you three types of neural network layers, which are the most basic but most important three types of neural network in deep learning. After we have some, after that, we will have some less technical stuff. We basically a chit chat about how the evolution of neural network. How did we? How did it come this far? So first introduction. The objective of this workshop, um, although deep learning is some like a very technical and high level stuff, but the objective of this workshop is to let you understand the general ideas of deep learning. And uh, of course, we will not go into uh, where well, there are summary at the end. Mm, there are summaries along the way, la, not at the end though. Voice make clear. How can I do that? Uh, is it really unclear or like too soft? It's a bit unclear, but how can I make it clear though? Mm. You mean if, um, if it's a bit echoey? Echoey, but I got no other place to go. <laughs> Maybe you can like turn up the volume a bit. Oh. Uh, sorry about that. Like the voice is really unclear, but there's nothing much. There's nothing much I can do about it. So. Yeah. So this this workshop is for you to understand the general ideas and uh, don't worry if you can't understand the details at in all the math calculation and other parts for coding right although the prerequisite says uh python knowledge is compulsory but coding is not really not much coding in this workshop like, although i will show you the how the code looks like but you don't have to understand the python in it just look at the big picture yeah so don't get too caught up with all the details. So how is deep learning different from machine learning? From this picture, you can see under the big topic of artificial intelligence, there's machine learning and the machine learning includes, includes uh, dozens of different machine learning methods which uh, some things like linear, linear regression, logistic regression, other things. Then as a subset of machine learning, there are neural networks. And uh, when there are many layers in a model, there are many layers of different uh, neural networks, we say it become a deep learning model. And uh, where, this is where deep learning located in the big picture of artificial intelligence. The steps taken when solving a task with deep learning method um, is almost the same as machine learning. Before we train the model, before we even start putting the model together, we have to pre-process all the data needed to train the model. After that, based on the nature of the task, we will assemble the model in train and deploy. Keep in mind that the data pre-process is a very important part. In this process, uh, how well the model performs largely depends on how well the training data is. In data pre-process, we not only collect them, but also use different tools to clean and format the data into the shapes and sizes we want them to be. For example, we want to make sure that uh, if we want to train a model to differentiate between dog and cat, we want to make sure the dog and cat data set do not include other pictures of other animals and then they are all in the same shape. Now let's see how the feedforward neural network works. It is the uh, which is the simplest type of neural network. 
in an FNN, you have only one input layer, one op, op, output layer, and uh, at least one hidden layer. Means there can be many, lay many hidden layers. The number of neurons in each layer is determined by the nature of the task. For example, if the model takes in a 9 by 9 pixel picture, and uh, the model needs to determine what number is it, what number is on the picture. The input layer will have like 81 neurons. Each takes in one value in the picture because 9 by 9, so we have 81 pixels. And uh, the output layer will have 10 neurons represents from 0 to 9. And uh, how, how data is passed from one layer to another. So now we don't not talking about the training process yet. We just see how uh, one picture is after one set of data, for example, a picture passed into the input layer, how the values are passed uh, until the next and the next, until we reach the output layer. So in an FNN, the reason it's called a feed forward neural network is because each value will be passed in to the next layer and next layer one by one. And uh, each neuron is connected to every neuron in the previous layer, as well as the next layer. Just like how this graph is shown, you can see each layer in up, each neuron in output layer is connected to every neuron in the hidden layer and uh, backwards also the same. Now you know the, how, how the FNN looks like. In the input layer, there's a single value be passed in <laughs> to each input to each neuron, and uh, th and uh, there's no calculation happens within these neurons. The data is just passed into the next one. The value is just passed into the next layer, and uh, in the hidden layer and output layer, uh, where most of the where all the calculation happens, and uh, what, so now, what does each neuron do? What, what is the function of each neuron? Actually, they performs the, they all does the same thing, and uh, it's very basic math population. From this step, you can see when when each neuron is connected to the neuron in the next next layer, there's a weight assigned to it. As you can see, the input layer x one until x n, they are connected to. This means. This one represents one neuron in the hidden layer. And uh, you can see there's a weight assigned to it. What the, this neuron does is that it calculates. It takes in every value from the previous layer. And uh, there's a weight assigned to it. It sums up the product of the value and the weight and add, adds it with a bias. So it takes x1 times w1 plus, plus x2 times w2 all the way. And after, after that's finished, it plus this bias. The result of this calculation is a sim single number, as you can tell. It's some, just some uh, plus and product, some primary school math. After that, that single value is passed into what we call an activation function. For now, just remember that the activation function decides if the value will be passed into the next layer. So far, anyone have any question? No. Okay. There are two commonly used activation function. Um, one is called relu, and one another one is called sig1. Relu is in in this FNN. Every neuron has every neuron has a relu function. The sigma is used in other cases, which we will see later. And the, what the relu function does is job it. What it does is really, really very simple. It takes in a value, as you can see from the graph, after it takes in a value, if the value is negative, the output of this function will be just zero. And then if the value is positive, the value will be kept, kept the same. So what this function does is just, it drops all the values that are less than zero. Because, um, you can take it that after this neuron does this series of calculation and then the final outcome is less than zero, 
you can say that the value is deemed, deemed considered not irrelevant in the next part of in the next layer of calculation. So when it passes through this fun activation function, it just uh, throw away and will not be passed into the next layer. As for the sigmoid function, also from the graph, take note that this line extends all the way to infinity and this line also extends to all the infinity. So sigmoid function, when it takes in a value, no matter how big or how small the value is, for example, 999, the, the, outcome, the output from this function will only range from zero to one. Mm, why is this useful? We can see in the later uh, code demo. But now you take note, uh, just keep it in mind that this function, ReLU function is the most important. It's, it's added to every neuron in the network. It's added to every neuron in this network. So every, every neuron has a ReLU function assigned to it. At the output layer, uh, there will be, there, each neuron also calculates the value passed to it, then the, apply the activation function. So just now, remember, if the value is less than zero, uh, it's uh, throw away. And if it's greater than zero, it's passed down. So in this, at the output layer, only one of these two neurons will be so-called activated. And this, the activated neuron will be our final outcome. Say this, if this is the model to train, dif train to differentiate between dogs and cats, one of these neurons will rep represent cat and another one represents dogs. One, since one of it will be activated at the end and uh, whichever activator is the final outcome of the model. Now you have the ideas, what are the weights and the biases? They are, they are called the parameters in the model. This mod, uh, they are randomly initialized when we put the model together and adjusted during the training process. Mm. Now you just need to know what parameters are. Later we will talk about how they are, how they are adjusted during the training process. And uh, take note that the number of parameters in a model determines the size of the model which affects the training time needed. It makes sense, right? Because if there are more parameters, in every, rep in every iteration, we have to adjust all the parameters so that next, next time when we calculate the answers will be so-called more correct. So if there are more parameters, it takes more time to adjust. From here, you can have an idea that how important activation function is you can see this is the picture of a handwritten digit, which has 700, 784 pixels. The value in each pixel is passed into one neuron in the input layer. And after, and the only, you can see only some of the input neurons are activated. And from there, the values are passed down to the next layer. And also some of, only some of the neurons are activated. And uh, again, they are passed down until they reach the output layer, you can see only one, one neuron is activated at the output layer, and that is the final outcome. The purpose of using this activation function is that it greatly reduces the calculation needed in order to, when we're putting, running through the data, running through the data, because if all these neurons are not activated, no calculation happens there and the less time is taken to train the model. So now that we talk about training process, during the training process, the model adjusts the parameters which were randomly initialized at first to produce, to produce a more correct answer. But the true question is, how does the model know if the parameter needs to be adjusted? And uh, how does the model adjust it? Which are very, reasonable to, to re very reasonable question. An answer to that is, we have a loss function and an optimization method, which are an mm, essential part of the model itself, besides the structure. What a loss function does is that it calculates the difference between the model's output and the correct output. 
so called so this function tells you or tells the model how close your answer is to the correct answer so the model knows if there's a need to adjust the parameters and the after the model knows there's a need to adjust the parameter it uses the optimization method to adjust the parameters in the model so in the next iteration as in where we pass in the next data the model's output will be closer to the correct output and the in sim oh in f and n right we use this loss function called back propagation which is a very tedious mathematical calculation using calculus and uh, of course you don't have to know that just remember the back propagation is used to count the loss in um, f and n and uh, know that there are different types of loss function and the optimization method they should be choose according to the nature of the task for example, when you have in task, a task, although there are maybe like three or five different optimization methods are all, all can be used, but they have they produce a different outcome. So you have to know which one is most suitable for the task. And uh, this this two part, we will choose choose the loss function and the optimization method when we define the define the model. So now that's all you need to know about FNN. Some key ideas mentioned when training, we need labeled training data. Like you need to tell the model, okay, this picture is a dog and that picture is a cat. And uh, there's an activation function used to remove the insignif insignificant values. In this, way, in this way, we can reduce the data size and uh, make the process faster. There's a loss function to calculate how correct the model's output is to tell the model if there is a need to adjust the parameters. And uh, then the parameters are adjusted by the optimization method at a certain rate. This certain rate means how much you want to adjust the parameters each time. Do you want to adjust it by 0 0.1 or 0 0.1, 0 0.1? And uh, this rate is also predefined by us when we define the model. In the training process, we one data is passed in. Uh, after it reaches the output, the model uses loss function to populate loss, and they use optimization method to adjust the parameters. And then this process repeats until the loss is very low, which means the model's output is very correct to the actual correct answer, which means the model has a high accuracy when performing the task. It is very important to know that in deep learning models, there might in a model there might be many different types of layers inside, but there but there's always an FNN at the end. Because what FNN does is to it acts as a classifier. Because all the deep learning models they only have one function, which is to classify. And then in order to do that, no matter how fancy the stru structure is. There's always the FNN attached to the end. Later, we will see that too. After that, we come to convolution, convolutional neural network. Actually, convolutional neural network, although there's a neuron in it, but the convolutional layers actually don't have the idea of neuron anymore. It's just a series of math computation. And uh, before we actually talk about how it works, how it works, uh, keep it in mind that the purpose of using a CNN is to extract features from the data and also reduce this data size. But that's not the primary goal. The primary goal is to extract features. Consider this task. We want to train a network a model to differentiate between, differentiate the picture between X and O. For example, this is uh, how a standard X looks like, and uh, the label is just X, and this is the file name X.jpg. And uh, it's a nine by nine pixels, total of maybe one pixels. We represent them. Of course, the model cannot just see the picture. We have to represent it in some way in that in numbers so the model can 
actually take in the value. So we use negative one to represent the black part and the one to represent the white part. While it is very easy to, for human, for, hu for us to tell how an X looks like, but you can, but it very, it's very easy, very hard for, mod for the deep learning model to tell because the object can come in many different sizes and shapes. For example, it can be at the corner, can be a smaller one, can be a twisted one, can be a uh, like thicken. So you, there's no way to, uh, if you want the model just to compare them pixel by pixel because there are so many possibilities of how an X can look like. So how do we train? Logically, we just think about it. How can we train the model so that it recognizes the X? We already know that we cannot compare them pixel by pixel. So what if, what if we let the model to recognize different parts of an X? And when the picture has all these parts, the model knows, oh, you have all the essential parts of an X, so it's an X. For example, let's say um, the model may not know how a face look like, but, if, but I will tell the model, okay, a face is something that has two eyes, one nose, and one mouth. So when the model sees all these features in me, it knows, oh, this is the face. With that in mind, we have what's called filters, which are, which are um, different features from the picture that we extract from and we call them a filters. From in the case of this X, we can see there are three different features, which the first one represents this small part. The second one represents this, this slanted part. This slant, this straight line is slanted to the right, and the, this one is slanted to the left. And then we have the center part. So in this case, we have three different filters. Take note that these filters are also parameter, which is which in actual training, unlike we choose the filter, we like write out the filters, the model will decide the filter by itself during the training process. After we have the filter, we perform a calculation that's called convolution. What we, what we do is that, remember this is the first filter from just from the previous, this one, the first filter, and uh, it's a three by three window. We take the, the value, the first value times the this first value in a selected window, and we get it, get the result, and uh, do the do the same to the second one, the third one, the fourth one, and fifth one. And uh, from here, after that, we after that we have all nine values. Then we take the average of these nine values and uh, put it back in the corresponding location. And uh, after after you use this filter to go through the whole picture, row by row, pixel by pixel, you will get what's called a feature map. Like after you fill in every value in this box, in this picture, you will get what's called a feature, filter map, okay? feature map. And uh, remember that we have three features. After we perform co convolution, we will we'll have three different feature maps. What you can see from this feature map is that because we take the average value, they are no longer just one and negative one. They range from zero or to one. As you can see, in this feature map, we want to extract the slanted, slanted part of the X. And uh, surprisingly, it's very easy to tell that, okay, we have this slanted part here and here, which is actually corresponds to the original picture. And uh, using another two filters, we have three different different feature maps, which includes all the features we wanted to extract. You can see the slanted line here, the center. What this, what this uh, value represents is that if your value is closer to one, means it mm, matches with the filter itself. And when the value is closer to zero, means this area doesn't match with the filter. So using these three filters, we can extract the features of this X. That's all for convolution. 
after convolution, we go to a process called pooling. There are two types of pooling. One is called max pooling, and another one is called average pooling, which you can tell how they work from the name. Max pooling, we just select the window, take the maximum value, and uh, put in a new, uh, new picture. And uh, then you slide the window by one pixel, take, take the maximum value again, and put in the next, next uh, corresponding box. And uh, do the same. You go what, row by row, pixel by pixel. And uh, after pooling, you will get a new map. Take note that after pooling, you can see that the number of values is greatly reduced. Originally, we have seven by seven. Now we only have four by four. When the data, when the data sizes are reduced, the time and the resources needed to perform the calculation is also reduced. So that's the reason why we want to do maximum max pooling. And uh, after max pooling, although the data set size is reduced so much, take note that the feature, the features we wanted are actually kept inside the map. So it actually, so the pooling process only throws away the irrelevant data. It still kept the important part, which are the features of the picture. And again, so this map are the final product after we perform one round of convolution and the one round of maximum pooling. But in actual models, there are often many, many, time, many repetitions of convolution and the pooling process. Um, for example, this is the original picture and this is the model. We convolute it once, Use the activation function, which just throw away the negative values because it's possible that values are negative. Convolute it again, throw away the negative values. Remember that when the value is negative, it means that area does not match with the future at all. So it's definitely not important when we want when we further calculate the data. And then we apply maximum pooling, convolute it again, throw away the negative value and the maximum pooling again. So CNN layers refers to both convolution layers and the pooling layers. They can be put together as you wish, it like, doesn't have to go in a fixed order as you can see from here. You can just experiment and see which combination gives the best result. So some key ideas in CNN. There's a convolution layer, uses a filter, to compare the picture, to compare with the picture. Remember the filter means, the filter represents the features in the picture that is useful when we classify the picture itself. And then there's a pooling layer, which keeps, keeps the best match, match result. Another thing you might not notice just now is that after the pooling process, you can't really tell from this one, but after the pooling process, no matter the feature is located at which part of the picture, they are always they can it can always be identified after the pooling process. So the C with these two layers, a CN can capture the features regardless of their location. So it not only capture the features in the picture and also regardless of their location, it only cares about whether they're whether the feature I'm looking for is, is there or not, it doesn't matter where it's located at. And in conclusion, in conclusion CN layers in a model, and, and again, a model can have many different types of layers. A CN layer in a model serves as a feature extractor because, and again, a very logical thing, reasonable thing, in, as a picture, you cannot use language to describe every feature in it. Like you cannot, you cannot use language to describe how a mouth, how an eye looks like. But using a CNN, it can extract the feature from the picture automatically. Let's look at this commonly used CNN model, VGT16. Uh, basically, it has 16 layers, that's why it's called 16, which is used for classification of pictures. As you can see, 
this the original picture is the 10, 224 by 224 pixels which, and the three layers. Why does it have three layers? Is because as you can see, this is a colored picture and uh, each pixel have RGB values, which are three numbers. That's why it's uh, passed into the model with the dimension of three. After that, you can see it goes through convolution with the activation and the max pooling convoluted again. And uh, after this whole C part of the end, what's important is what's important is here. See fully connected layers. Just uh, also means F and N. Now. Remember that F, what FN does is classification. So although there's uh, so many layers of CNN. Oh, CNN means convolutional neural network. So although there's uh, so many layers of, of CNN, in the end, in the very end, there's, there's still that have a need for the FNN to do the actual classification. Well, this part of CNN does is that they extract the features. And the FNN use the features extracted by the CNN to do the actual classification and the produces the output. Now let's look at the actual example, see how a code of the model looks like. So in this task, we want to train the model to differentiate between dogs and cats. Yeah. And uh, for the purpose of this workshop, I will not actually go to the internet and search for all kinds of dogs and pictures of dogs and cats. And uh, because there are already data set that's prepared for you on the internet, so you don't have to do, do this by yourself. They are already collected for you. So first we download the data set. Oh, as you can see, this data set includes 25,000 images, and uh, which is a lot. And it will take a very long for this model to train. And uh, again, for the purpose of this workshop, we will take 2,000 of pictures from the full data set to decrease the training time. And uh, unzip the file. And uh, you can see, as I mentioned at the start of this workshop, data pre-process is a very important part when solving a task with deep learning. As you can see, all these Python code are all in part of the data pre-process. We download the data set on zip, create the training directory, and again, assign the variables. So now we can see, this is how the pictures are labeled. It's very easy. You just call the file name cat and dog. So the model knows, okay, this is a cat that, that is a dog. Now let's see some examples of the pictures. From here, you can see. And uh, we split the data set into training and the validation set. And uh, obviously, the training set is used to train the model. Why do we need a validation set? It's because after we train the model, we have to, we, and before we deploy, we want to first see how well the model performs. And using this validation set, we will get, get a, see how accurate the model does the task. So yeah, prepare the data, then inspection of the data is also the part of the process. From here you can see, and again, you can see all these pictures come in all different sizes and shapes. And the object in this, they are at different, uh, different color, different positions. Some even have two inside. So how do we, so the CNN enables the model to extract the features, the common parts among these, the similarities of all the, of among the pictures. Okay, now we build the model. Um, in deep learning, we use this Python library called TensorFlow. We call it, which is a deep learning framework, basically a Python library. And uh, so we have all the tools prepared for us and we don't have to actually write out everything by ourselves. And uh, in order to put up a model, it's just like that, like 10 to 11 lines. We have the model equals to, and the, the library itself. Take note that this is a sequential model. 
this is layer by layer. Yeah, there are other model structures that are that's not layer by layer, and and uh, later we will come to that too. So now we just tell say that okay, first one convolution, max pooling, you convolute again, max pooling again, convolute again, max pooling again. Yeah. And the uh, see here the activation function we choose as J loop, and the input shape is 150 by 150 pixels and the uh, three colors, which is uh, like RGB value lab. At the very end, we have the sigmoid. See that there's only one neuron in the last layer, but this is a binary classification. How how can we tell uh what does the value represent? This that's where we use the sigmoid function. Recall that. Recall that what the sigmoid function does is that it shrinks the value into into a range of zero and one. So in this case, if the final value value falls between zero and negative five, maybe it's a cat. And then if the value falls into falls in between zero point five and one, it's a dog. So this is what sigmoid function does. Lagging. Okay, so now we put the model together. As you can see with this library, right, how easy it is just to write a deep learning model. It's like 10 lines. In front, although there are so many lines, but they are all data pre-processed. The model itself only takes like 10 lines. Then from here, we can see the model summary. And again, it's a sequential model. Now you have the here you have all the parameters, number of parameters. So in this whole, this entire model have 9 million parameters, which is not really a lot. It's considered as small. Yeah, just, yeah. Okay. Then after we have the model structure itself, it's not enough. Remember that we need a loss function and the optimization method. From here, we choose the optimize, optimizer and the loss function is binary cross entropy and the matrix matrix is used to accuracy is we want to see how accurate our model performs instead of some other numbers and the, see here the learning rate is 0 0.001 means every time the model adjusts the parameter it will adjust by 0 0.001 and uh, again data process we want to do this because you can see they come in all different sizes and the model the model only takes in 150 by 150. So you have to cut them and shape them into that size. And uh, yeah, just some Python code to do that. Okay, here is the training, which not much, just tell, start the training process. The number of epochs means we feed the same set of training data into the model for 15. Hey, actually, okay, 15 is not a lot, won't take much time. Yeah, so we take the same set of training data feed into the model again and again for 15 times. We do that. Mm. Sometimes this method works well, sometimes it doesn't. It, and uh, you, have, you have to experiment, experiment and uh, to see how, what's the most suitable number. And you have the cost, and then you have the cost, consider the cost and benefit ratio because if you want to uh, have more, more epochs, it takes more time to train the model, but having more epochs doesn't guarantee an uh, increase in the accuracy. From here, you can see the first time we feed the training date, uh, the first time we have a loss is 0 0.96. And then, oh, another thing is how big or how small this value is. Uh, has actually has no meaning. What's meaningful is that you have to see how the loss function decreases after each epoch. So you can actually tell that, oh, the model is performing better and better. How big or how small does it matter? And uh, from accuracy of 59 all the way up until 95. And uh, in the validation data, we, we can also see that the accuracy increases. This is what I mean by the cost and benefit ratio of having more epochs. You can see in the first five rounds, 
the accuracy increases by a lot. But after that, you do it again and again, but the accuracy don't really increase that much anymore. So is it really worth it to spend more time to get like 3% more higher accuracy? That's something you need to consider when training your own model. Is it worth the time and the resources just to make the accuracy be like 1% or 2% higher? And uh, just last round. Now we have fin finished the training. You can see the final loss from um, down to like maybe 3% of the first round. And the, the accuracy on the validation set is 0 0.7. Now let's see how, let's try it out. Oh, as you can see, I uploaded a picture of the cat and uh, yes, he successfully identified it as a cat. What I wanted to know from this whole notebook, right, is just that it shows how tedious and uh, important it is to pre-process the data before you actually pass them into the model. And uh, the actual model, the actual part of writing the model is really very simple. The coding part of this is simple, but you have to do a lot of calculation to see how many layers you actually want. And all these numbers are adjustable. So you have to decide for yourself, okay, do I want to put 16 or 32 or 64? Okay, that's all for this example. Next, we look at the recurrent neural network, RNN. The idea of the structure of RNN is um, there's less math calculation in it compared to CNN, and uh, but the structure is very complicated. So I, so I will not talk about the structure in this workshop. Instead, I will tell you um, how it works in a, like giving an intuition of how it works. So why do we even need RNN? An issue with FNN is that the data, the, remember the data we passed in are one by one, one step by one step. And therefore the relationship between the data cannot be captured by the neural network. Consider this uh, NLP task of labeling noun and verb in a sentence. And, uh, we use, and we use this very simple sentence as example, uh, wrap it, it Carrot. For us, we have the, all the grammar knowledge, of course, we can just, or just tell, don't even need to look at the sentence, we can just tell rabbit is a noun, it is a verb, and the carrot is a noun. However, imagine we're passing this into an F and N. The model, the model will only know rabbit is a noun, okay, next step, it is a verb, okay, next step, carrot is a noun, okay. So what model learn from the process? Nothing. With the grammar knowledge, we know that usually after a verb, most likely is a noun. A noun comes after a verb. If the model knows, okay, if when the model sees carrot, it remembers what was in the what was the previous data. If it remembers the previous data is a verb, then it will know, okay, because the previous data is a verb, so this will most likely be a noun. However, FNN does not have, uh, is not able to do that. Therefore, therefore we have the need for RNN. So since we are not talking about how actually how the structure of RNN works, all you all you need to know about RNN is that. It simply locks its output back to its input. And the, but what does that mean to lock its in output back to its input? From this graph, you can see. Mm. First, take this with R with F and N, you don't you do not have this circled arrow. The data is passed into the hidden layer and output back to it. But in RNN, you have this circle. And uh, if you un unload a recurrent neural, 
neural network based on the time step. What this uh, this uh, detour means when the value is passed in, it not just it not only produces the output, it also produces the hidden value, which are passed into which are kept inside the neuron. So when the neuron compute calculate the next value, it remembers what was it, in, what was inside just previously. So a part of the result is passed back into the next time step, means the next calculation. So when calculating the next set of input, what came before it will be taken into consideration. So the idea behind RN is that the neurons, you know, is the, uh, we go back to neuron again, just now CNN does, does not have neurons, but RN, RN have. A neuron, the neurons have some sort of short-term memory, providing them with the possibility to remember what was in this neuron just previously. Thus, the neurons can pass information on to themselves in the future and analysis, anal analyze things. Now look back at this NLP task again. Our NLP stands for Natural Language Processing. That's all the tasks related to language. Yeah. So if we pass this sentence into RNN one by one, right? One, two, three. When we pass, first pass in rabbit, and the, and the model knows it's a noun, that information is kept inside. When when the if is passed in, it will take into consideration that the previous value is a noun, but it does not have the effect on this one. However, when we pass, but the, the fact that it is a verb will also be kept inside the neuron. So when the carrot is passed in, or you will, you, so then you will remember, oh, the previous set of data is a uh, verb. And that fact, that piece of information will be taken into consideration when calculating this part. In this way, it can capture the relationship among each data. So-called capture the context of the thing, of the sequence. Um, that's all you know, need to know for RN. And it only has this one function. It, it, uh, unlike CNN is a totally, CNN is totally different from FNN, but RNN is a deep, extension of FNN. It fixes uh, some problems that FNN cannot, uh, cannot fix. Now let's get another notebook of how our model works. Mm. We will train the simple RN for forecasting. Uh, let me just run this few. And again, data preprocess is a very tedious job where most of the coding happens. We need a whole set of utilities to do the data preprocess part. Okay. Uh, in this case, we, there's no data set prepared for us. We will just uh, generate the data by ourselves. Okay. Forecasting. Basically, you're taking the information from the past and predict what will happen in the future. As you can see, the x axis is on time from 0 o'clock all the way to 2 o'clock. And uh, for human, again, for human eyes, very easy to tell. This happens with a clear pattern, right? It goes down, up, uh, hits the same, go up again, go down. And uh, what we want to do is uh, train the RN model to are uh, able to capture the relationship, like capture the how this is going. And uh, using this past information to predict what will happen in the future, which makes sense, right? because RN can capture the context. So if you take that context context as the past, then you have all the information needed to predict the future. That's why it's called, that's why it's called forecasting. Okay, we, again, we split the data into training and the validation step. Another pre-process. 
And again, writing the model itself is really very easy. There's a few lines of code that's it. And then we use two layers of simple RN neural network. And uh, we set the first one, return sequence equals to true means, yeah, the data will be kept within now. If you set it to false, then you just act as a normal CN, or normal FNN. And uh, in this case, we said that learning, learning rate really small, and we choose the optimizer, and uh, choose the loss function. And uh, I have to emphasize this again. So when solving a deep learning task, most of the hustle happens at the data preprocess, as you can see from this, in this case, even, even worse than the previous CNN task, so many, so much code for the data preprocess. In the actual actual model itself only takes like this is all the everything about the model itself. Then we start the training process. In this case, because it was that is really fast, we train it for 100, 100 iterations. And again, remember just now the loss is zero point something. And this tells you and the how big the house or how small the value is really doesn't matter. What matters is how the value changes after each iteration. As you can see, at first it's 19. It drops from 19 to 10, all the way down, 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 to five. And again, the number of epochs, right? As you can see, in the first maybe 20 epochs, then the loss function drops, drops by so much. But after that, although you train it again and again, but the loss does not change. It's barely changing. But by the time it's spent, so you are spending time for very little very little result. So you have to really have to uh, consider the number of epochs carefully. Imagine, imagine you're training a model that takes two days to train, and uh, after one day you realize, oh, the loss is not decreasing anymore, but you cannot stop it halfway. Now yeah, how wasted. So it, you have to consider the number of epochs really carefully. So after at the end, the loss is 4.9. And uh, we use it to do a prediction. This will take a bit more time because it not only calculates the value, then it also needs to draw it out. As you can see, many things are happening. And again, because we have all the tools, necessary tools prepared that I prepared for us. The, uh, the code needed for model is really simple. You can just call the library. Oh, again, this is a sequential model. Yeah, layer by layer. You just call the library, have all the things you need. That's like putting a label. It's so easy. You don't have to go from the source material all the way to build, uh, get the block by yourself. It's already prepared for you. So this is the final outcome of our model's prediction. The blue ones are the actual, the supposed to be result, and the yellow ones are the predicted results. As you can see, it does it pretty well. It, most, of, most of the parts overlap. However, some parts are still not good enough. As you can see here, it barely matches it, barely match. In this notebook, the coding part is not really the focus. And uh, because the idea behind RN is really that simple, unlike CNN have so many different types of calculation. And the RN, it, it really only does one job, plots its output back to its input. And uh, therefore gives, gives it the possibility to maintain the information of the past so it can predict the future. Okay, so basically that's all for the technical part of this workshop. After that, it's just some easy chit chat, easy chit chat about evolution of DL or evolution of deep learning. How we went from basic machine learning algorithms, the conventional, so called conventional machine learning algorithm, in order to differentiate from neural network, we call them conventional machine learning methods. 
first you need to keep in mind that the deep learning is a is a tool just like mathematics is used to solve just like how mathematics are used to solve physics problems deep learning is a tool and it's used to solve tasks to solve other problems and the two fields that uses deep learning that of that uses deep learning are computer vision and the natural language processing and uh, maybe another there's another one is voice recognition but I think it also can be classified as natural language preprocessing. So CV and NLP are the two big fields that use deep learning. CNN is mostly used in computer vision. If you remember that what it does is only to extract features and does it read and it does a really good job at doing that. Although there are also some NLP models that completely depends on CNN which kind of makes sense, such as the famous text scan model used for text classification. See, you take one, uh, in this, this is the structure of a text CNN model. What each word is represented in a sequence. Then if you apply the CNN to extract the features and the use for classification, it's actually quite complicated, but it's not really important for you to know that you just need to, all you need to know is just this part. You have to know the structure of this. <laughs> What's more interesting is Bob. So the jobs did by CNN is very simple and basic in extracts. Oh, it's not basic, but it's very important. Okay. Uh, it extracts features from pictures. Oh, but RNN is a much more interesting layer however oh, the pro the idea behind r and and emphasizing that, that again is that the neurons have some sort of short-term memory providing them with the possibility to remember what was in this neuron just previously and the, although r and n achieves this achieves that it is not good enough if you pay attention enough you can already tell when the, if the sequence it only has a short term memory, when the sequence is too long, the information kept at the start will not be able to affect those are far, far away from it. For example, if a sentence that has 15 words inside, the meaning of the first word would, may not be able to affect the last word. That's what happens in no more R and N. But however, we need the model to have the ability to take the meaning of important words until, until the whole sequence is process finished. So with that, to fix this problem, researchers develop LSTM, which stands for long short-term memory, to allow the data kept for a longer period of time. Sorry for the typo. Uh, how it does that is in uh, on top of basic RNN, it adds a locking mechanism to decide if a data is important. And if it's important and it's value, valuable, the locking mechanism locks the data inside the neuron for a longer period of time. However, when the sequence is extremely long, OSTM will not perform well also. Imagine, imagine we want to give the model one whole paragraph and ask the model to write the next paragraph. And, uh, and then the one we've given to the model is like 100 words long. LSTM would, may not be able to do that because yeah, even, the, has a, even it has a long short-term memory, it might, be, it might be not long enough. Or, or maybe just cannot feel that much information at the same time. And also the training process in LSTM is very slow as the processing of input is dependent on the previous one. For example, if we want to count from 1 to 100, in some tasks, we can speed the work to uh, in half. We can tell two computers to count, one, to count from 1 to 50 and add the result together. That reduces the time by half. However, in this case, we have only, can only let one computer to actually count from 1 to 50. And, uh, the model needs to calculate them one by one. So it takes a very long time to train. Cannot utilize the computation power of the machine. 
and uh, to solve this problem with LST and oh. And uh, although it will not perform well when the sequence is extremely long, but in some tasks, we can still use LSTM. And uh, in actual, uh, when we actually solve the task, simple RNN network is barely used. Yeah, although, yeah, simple RNN, work, RNN is barely used. People always choose LSTM first. They are like similar function, but LSTM does that does it much better. And to solve that, to solve this problem with LSTM, there comes there comes the ultimate invention in the deep in the field of deep learning. In two thousand and seventeen, Google published a paper called "Attention is All You Need." They developed this new structure, new uh deep learning structure called transformer. Using what's called an attention mechanism, solving all the problems with RNN and LSTM. And because this model's powerful performance, it's the most hyped model until now. Hyped as in, uh, it's a very popular research topic to start to do. And uh, every year, as there are so many relevant research papers uh, about it are published. And uh, the transformer structure are used commonly both in both CV and NLP tasks. Uh, for you, just for you to know, this is how a transformer looks like. Oh, very interestingly, this is no longer a sequential model, as you can tell, it's not layer by layer. This is what this is what we call a encoder and decoder structure. The side on the left is the encoder, and the side on the left is right is the decoder. In a standard transformer block, the n is 12. So we have 12 encoders first, then we have 12 decoders. Yeah. And the, at the very start of this workshop, I tell you that the job of FNN is it acts as a classifier. And, and see, although this although the structure of transformer is very fancy, right? There are so many things inside, it always ends up with the linear layer, which is the always ends up with the feed forward with the FNN. That's where, because no matter how fancy you want to process the data, you always come to classification. And uh, in a standard transformer block, when this N equals to 12, there are 110 million parameters inside. Remember just now the CNN model we have, it has 9 million. And the one basic transformer block has, oh, not basic, a standard transformer block has 110 million. Why is it called a standard transformer block? Because when they developing this model, they actually try with different sets of different number of parameters. And uh, so they train different types of transformer block and find out that in this case, when n is 12 and the number of parameters is 100, 100 million, it, its performance is the best and has, has the best highest cost and benefit rate, benefit ratio. And the uh, 110 million sounds like a lot, right? But in for actually the really, really big model, what they do is they stack, they stack many transformer blocks together. Can you imagine when they stack many transformer blocks together? There are maybe like billions or even trillions of parameters, which takes like few days to train uses thousands of GPUs and the cost the cost for electricity can be about tens of hundreds of thousand dollars. That's why only the big companies like Google and other Microsoft can afford such big models. However, big model does not guarantee the performance as well. There are cases where you want to just do a simple task, a simple model can achieve an accuracy say 80%. And a big model, which has like 100 times of more parameters, and uh, its accuracy is 90%. So you have to consider, is it worth it to spend so much more resources just on 10% of higher accuracy? There are many parts, many components of deep learning model you need to consider, depending on the resources you have, the time, the time you have to train the model, the hardware resources, like how many GPUs you actually have. 
uh, training is a very costly process. That's why uh, deep learning labs all need to spend a lot of money just to buy CPUs for their students to use to train the model. Okay, I think that's all for this workshop. Thank you for your attention for the past one hour plus. If anyone has any question, you can just uh, text in the chat right now or ask me in the Discord channel. Yeah, that's all. Thank you.